Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. So grateful that you're here, that we get to worship together uh, today. Man, I love summer. I love the opportunities, the fun of summer. Before we get going, I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about something that's coming up last week of June and last week of July. This is really the vision of our small groups, Pastor, Pastor Tom, uh, to just see our church connected and even reconnecting or connecting with new people and uh, just the opportunity of just having uh, some fun together. So uh, the last week of June, 23rd through 29th, uh, we're just going to have some fun and fellowship Uh, different things or outings or events uh, going on. Uh, It's kind of small group driven. We'd love for your small group to uh, put one of these together, but uh, hey, we'll take an idea or anything for anybody who wants to uh, put something together. Uh, Just simple, simple, simple things like bonfire or outdoor movie, or maybe you just want to get people together with their kids and play at the park or uh, do a cookout or uh, something like that. Um, I would love to know what you're doing. You don't have to have the whole thing planned now, but we'd love to know this week uh, who's in to host something like that. I think I'm going to do a guy's pickleball night, uh, one, of, one of those nights. Would love to uh, see you at that, but just increase the connection in our church. Maybe you're like, hey, I just want to sit in the air conditioning. Do that then. Just say like, hey, we're going to have an air conditioned chat. That's what, because that's what I want to do. Uh, that's fine. Put that out there. Eric, an AC visit and uh, uh, just sit around and, and connect with one another. Keep it simple. Uh, keep it fun. And uh, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks, but I just kind of wanted that to surface or be on the radar, especially for our small group, our small group leaders. Uh, we are continuing a series today in the book of Exodus where we're looking at the Ten Commandments. Read this title with me, if you would please. Old Rules for a New Life. And we're looking at how God's old rules, the Ten Commandments, can offer us a new way of living that we can actually uh, honor God and enjoy our life. I wonder when I say the name God, what thought comes to your mind? What pictures do you see? What emotions come to the surface? I don't know what you think of when I say the name God, but I know that it's often the case that our perception of God or how we view God is actually determined by how we've experienced people who have used God's name. Like you can go and learn a lot about the character of God. You could go take a seminary class on the character of God, listen to sermon series on the character of God, instruct yourself on the character of God from the Bible. But what will most shape you is how you experience other people who have claimed and carried and used God's name in your life. You know, when I hear the name Lauren, or when I see those six letters written on a piece of paper, all kinds of emotions rush to my mind. Why? Because that's the name of my wife. And so I get emotions of love and life and what she has represented to me when I hear her name or see it written. Her name is significant to me. It's come to represent certain things in my life because she has carried that name. Which brings us to the third commandment. And the third commandment is this. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now, you've probably seen things about the name of God in Scripture, even in a lot of the songs that we sing. You might ask, what's the big deal about God's name? It seems to be a really, really big deal. If you're taking notes, write this down if you would, please. God's name represents his character. The name of the Lord is holy because, hello, God is holy. The name of the Lord represents glory, majesty, sovereignty, salvation, because that's who our God is. And we're to esteem and honor his name. We honor his name because we revere God. To do any less is to take his name in vain, to misuse it. Now, when they would have heard this commandment, the Israelites at the base of this mountain, one of the things that God is speaking to is uh, he did not want his name dishonored. And people would take a vow And when they took a vow or took an oath or wanted to bring weight to something, they would want to legitimize it. They'd bring God's name into it. 
But then the problem was they'd break that oath or break that promise or not follow through. And what it would indicate is, wow, this man is willing to take my name into it to legitimize this promise, but then also willing to break it. It shows that it was, it's, it was like denying God's existence because it's saying, I'll break that. I don't fear God. So a marriage vow, a promise to pay you back, an oath, that what I'm saying is true. Like you've probably heard this, this command given in a different uh, way of translating it. It reads, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So don't decide to live by him, don't take his name, and then not follow through. Jesus said, hey, don't say you love me and then not do what I teach you. That doesn't add up. And the first idea is essentially this. Our lives are to be a representation of who God is. That's the principle, that's the rule that uh, we're bringing this weekend to this command. Our lives are to be a representation of who God is. You might write that down. Now, the first translation we read said misuse. The other said to take. The Hebrew word means to carry. And so the command is saying, don't carry God's name in a way that's meaningless, in a way that's hurtful. And this command is not so much what we say with our mouth, it's how we live our life. And we're to represent God in the way we live. One chapter earlier, God talks about them carrying his name. It says, Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, you will be my kingdom of, say this word with me, priests, my holy nation. What's a priest? A priest is one who represents God to people and represents people back to God. And so there's a weight that comes with this calling. In Exodus, we're told that when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he etched his name on their souls. And when Jesus came to die for all humanity, he made a way for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved, that those people are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. And so all who've been delivered by God, for all of us today who follow Jesus, know that on the skin of your soul bears the name of God. It's written on you. You carry his name, the family name. And he says, don't do it in vain. I started thinking about um, my name and like our name and being written down and thought about when my kids started going to school, we went and toured the school. And the first thing I noticed when we walked in was this big lost and found pile of stuff. Water bottles, jackets, coats. You've seen the lost and found pile at your school? Yeah? It's amazing. I was like, wow, I'm in awe. And there's all these things like bizarre stuff kids take with them to school, like they snuck in there. And then there's things like, okay, how is someone not missing? It's like a whole backpack with everything they need to achieve school. Is no one noticing this? What's going on? So they said, write your kid's name on all their stuff so that when they lose it, we can get it back to them. So I just grabbed a couple things. This is Sterling's hat, and we just wrote in the marker under the bill his name, S. Walter. And this is Landry's water bottle. I don't know if you can see this, but it's written on the bottom, Landry Walter. And I don't know how many times these two things have been returned to me because they have. So one day, uh, we're trying to leave the house. And come on, parents with kids, when you try to leave, the, it's a great time of testing and trial and tribulation and <laughs> Lord, save us, please. And um, they're looking for their socks and shoes and hat. And Sterling says to me, we need a lost and found around here so I can find some stuff. <laughs> and I go, dude, we're at home. It's called putting things away. Try it sometime. Give it a shot. But maybe some of you today are lost because you've forgotten who you belong to and you don't know your way back because you've forgotten the name that's written on you and you've forgotten whose name is inked on your soul and the third commandment is a beautiful reminder in a world where we're forgetting who we are. I mean, our culture is so obsessed with identity yet we're struggling with it. Dying to know who we belong to. 
the great I am, the Lord, Yahweh, the Apostle Paul. Read this one with me. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. He's restating the third command. To represent God in all you do. It's a big challenge to imitate God, but it's a great promise that you are his child. And you see the idea, it's very, very simple. As someone gets to know you, they're also getting to know God. And as they're getting to know you as a child of God, as they're seeing you live your life, they're ultimately getting to see who God is really in their life because you represent him in all that you do. But you go, whoa, how can I do that? Well, here's the problem. Here's the tension. Is that all of us have a gap between what we say we believe and how we behave, don't we? We all have a gap between what we say we believe and how we really behave. We belong to God, but we can't measure up to that. We bear a family name that we can't carry correctly, and all of us struggle, all of us, every single one of us struggle with something that Jesus talked about quite often, which is hypocrisy. I say I believe this thing, but I don't always do it. And while the rivers are clapping Yahweh's name and the mountains are shouting the name of the Lord, what sin has done all of, to all of us is it's led us to not be able to live up to this standard. And all of us, as we come to the third command, must get very real about the reality that there is a gap between what we say we believe and how we behave. And do you know who understands that? Jesus understands it. But how we deal, Jesus knows, understands. In fact, came from heaven to earth because he knew there would always be a gap that we couldn't live up to it. We couldn't fulfill the law. But how we approach Jesus in that and how we deal with this gap between what we say we believe and how we behave is really, really crucial. If we deal with it in a proud way, an unrepentant way, it really does not go well with Jesus. If we deal with it in a repentant way, in a humble way, it actually goes miraculously well. I'll show you this moment here in Mark uh, chapter 7. This is Mark's gospel biography of Jesus. Look at this with me. It says, one day some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. Now they have not come Uh, to like see Jesus in a way, like learn from him or honor him or anything. They've been sent out of Jerusalem to come and spy on him. And they spy on him and his followers and they say, they notice that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. I didn't have room in your notes for all these verses, but it gives a parenthesis where it explains this Uh, this tradition. It says the Jews, especially the Pharisees, uh, do not eat until they poured water over their cupped hands as required, not by the law, but as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they've immersed their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions that they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So, The Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, you hypocrites. uh, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship, they worship me in vain, or their worship is a farce, like it's not, it's not real. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. So what's interesting is, follow me on this now, is we've taken the third commandment, do not use the name of the Lord in vain. And many people interpret that as don't use God's name as a negative word. Don't use it as a swear word. Don't use it as a cuss word. When actually the problem that the command speaks to is that you can honor God with your lips, say all the right things, but not back it up. You can make a vow in the name of God, make a promise, make an oath, say a prayer, preach a sermon, but not back it up. You can 
do all these things. You can come up with these traditions, present them in a beautiful, godly way, but it's not really what God wanted. So let me be clear. Cursing with God's name, it's inappropriate. It's dishonoring. It shows you don't take God seriously. It's foolish. But you could stop using Jesus' name, God's name as a cuss word, stop using hell as a cuss word, and still not come anywhere close to honoring the third commandment of not taking his name in vain. Are you following me here? Because the problem is that we misuse God's name when we attach it to our own agenda. To misuse God's name, you might write this down, is to attach it to your own agenda, your own thing. And so we make up rules and loopholes and make decisions, all these things. We bring God into stuff that he has nothing to do with. And we'll say, well, God told me to do this. God's leading me to do this. God says this is okay. God says this is not okay. Or how about this one? God told me to tell you. One time after a church service years ago, someone came up to me and said, God told me to tell you. And they told me something. And then right after that, amazingly, some unrelated, someone comes up to me and says, God told me to tell you. And I'm like, whoa, if it's the same thing, I'm listening. It was the exact opposite of what the other person had said. I'm like, well, someone's making this up. <laughs> Can't both be right. Turns out they were both wrong, but that's a story for another time. But because here's the reality is God does tell people things. And God sometimes does tell people to tell people something. And God does say that certain things are okay and certain things are not okay. So if you're gonna say, God says this is not okay, you better be right. It's not just your own agenda, your own thing that you made up. And we bring God into things without reverence to the fact that he is working and we have to honor that. And there are things to pray for in Jesus' name. So when we bring him into it, we better be honoring. Don't take his name in vain. Another thing that happens is we'll promise to do things. We'll promise to love and to cherish. We'll take an oath, but we'll not keep it. And we'll say Jesus is Lord and we'll honor his name, but not let Jesus guide our life. And so a good question to ask ourselves is where are you at the risk of misrepresenting God, honoring him with your lips, saying the right things, but your heart is far from him, saying the right things in your life, but really no desire to try and measure up. Where in your marriage, in your parenting, at work, at school, are you carrying the name of God, but you're actually misrepresenting the character of God? And we have all known, heartbreakingly, we have known or heard of leaders, Christian leaders, church leaders, who claim God's name and use God's name in public settings. And they honor God's name and you never hear them like disrespect God's name or use it as a cuss word. But in a private life, in private settings, have done awful, terrible things. And maybe their theology was not wrong, but their integrity was completely missing. And that is rooted in our inability to obey the third commandment. So what do we do with that? What do we do with this gap? that exists? What do we do with the times we've misused God's name for our own agenda? And I want you to consider this. If you find yourself in a position where you've been hurt by someone who's misused God's name, or if you find yourself maybe, oh my goodness, I am misusing the name of God. I'm taking it in vain. I'm carrying it in vain. I think the passage we're about to look at offers a path forward. I'm going to use a lot of scripture, scripture that's not even in your notes, because I think we need to go to God's word now and let him direct us and guide us and lead us to this. And Jesus helps us understand what it could potentially look like to represent God. It says, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, watch this, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. Then he brings out three things. He says, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. And then he goes on to say, the greatest among you must be a servant. 
But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This was a tagline of Jesus' teaching that he uses a number of times. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus here gives us three ways of how our hypocrisy misrepresents God. Number one is we place unrealistic expectations on other people. The text said they crush people with unbearable religious demands. They would tell people things to do, but not do it themselves. And we may think, well, I'm nothing like a Pharisee, but how often in your life do you place unrealistic expectations on other people? You expect things from your family, from your friends, from your church, from your job, from your kids that are higher than what God expects. And they're higher than what you're willing to do yourself. You expect all these things out of their leadership, but you're not willing to lift a finger to help yourself. And we begin to live this life with unrealistic expectations that I should never be offended, that I can withhold forgiveness. But then we don't lift a finger to help because when we mess up, we want grace (laughs) and we want forgiveness. And so we put unrealistic expectations on others. This is a mark of leadership. You look for a man, when that per- does this person do what they're saying should be done? Number two, another way our hypocrisy misrepresents God is we appear better than we actually are. Jesus said everything they do is for show. In other words, there's nothing authentic about it. There's nothing genuine about it. And there's a temptation to to draw up a version of ourselves that's simply not real because it's a version we think will be accepted. And Jesus reserved his sharpest judgment for these Pharisees who were constantly appearing better than they actually were. Not because he wasn't harsh on them because they struggled. Friend, Jesus loves struggling people. Do you see that in the Gospels? I mean, just imagine with me if one of these Pharisees came to him and said, man, I'm really hurting I don't get it. I'm confused. The responsibility of this, I think we may be getting it wrong. I don't know what to do. God, I'm struck. Can you imagine the great, we see in the gospels, the grace he would have had for that. But no, they wouldn't admit their struggle. They used God as a cover for their need to be noticed. You see, the goal of integrity, the goal of faithfulness is not that you'll be perfect. It's that you'll be the same. Per- integrity means integer. That I'm going to be the, the, what you see at church is what you get at the gym, what you get at home, what you get at work. God cannot love who you pretend to be. God cannot heal the version of yourself that you make up and present to others. He wants to heal the real you, love the real you, offer grace to the real you. And so don't try to appear better than you really are. Quite frankly, this point is why someone said, man, you make fun of yourself a lot in the sermons. And I'm like, I I fail. I'm worthy of being made fun of. (laughs) I need God's grace. I need his goodness in my life. But three ways our hypocrisy misrepresents God. Number three is we value status over serving others. And in our misrepresentation of God, there's a temptation to value status rather than serving other people, to use his name in a way that protects a position that we're after rather than just actually valuing people and serving them. Just think about this. Think about the ways that you have protected yourself to preserve a kind of status, a position, and neglected the role of doing what was best for people. I think that's so damaging in the church A church leader will fail rather than being real, rather than being honest, rather than confessing their sin, rather than doing what was best for the people. They hide it, they conceal it. To hold on to some status, hold on to their position. Now the good news for us right now is that Jesus actually offers us a better way. He really does. You see with Jesus, I'm gonna give you three ways here and I'll show you the text that I get get this out of. I want to show you these three things and then you can see this in in how we are to uh, live like Christ and represent him. But we can represent God with Jesus. I can represent God through compassion. In contrast to the temptation to place unrealistic expectations on people, Jesus offers a way of compassion. What I find so compelling about Jesus 
Just watch, just reading through how he interacts with people. I'm always moved by his ability to maintain compassion without compromise. And he has a way of being able to approach people, be compassionate towards them, and not lose his moral conviction. That is something we've got to recover today. And so many Christians are withholding compassion, withholding a willingness to really know a person or understand that person because they're afraid if I interact with this person or go to this person, my circle of believers is going to think that I'm, that I'm losing ground, that I'm giving into my morals, their morals, losing my convictions. And we've got to recover compassion, understanding someone, knowing someone, being moved by their hurt or where they've come from or what they've been through. And that's a challenge that with Jesus, I can do. He shows us how to do it. With Jesus, number two, I can represent God through humility. And we use the word humble, humility all the time. I wanted to use that, the words that the Bible's using here, but you might just write out to the side genuineness or authenticity. Because time and time again, we see that this is what Jesus is after. Don't fake it. Don't try to earn it. And in Christ, you receive God's love. There's an opportunity to be authentically yourself. It's the only place you'll find healing. That's the only way to overcome sin is to be genuine about what you're struggling with. Jesus tells a story that I think is relevant here. Let's let him tell this story, told a story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer, I thank you God that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Pharisee misused the name of God, misused prayer to announce, look how good I am. The tax collector's prayer should be our prayer because we need God's mercy every day. A third way I can represent God is through service. And I want to say this so clearly and strongly, but lovingly today. If you worship Jesus Christ, you worship a servant you worship a servant, but so many of you are unwilling to serve. You're taking God's name in vain. You're carrying the name of Christ who is a servant, but you refuse to serve. I'll show you this in Philippians 2. Notice these three things. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? That make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, watch this connection to the third commandment, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. With Jesus, we can represent God. We can carry his name. We can remember who we belong to. But I want to close speaking to the person um, who has been hurt by someone who has misused God's name. I don't know what that may have looked like, but someone was carrying the name of God, representing God to you, and they misused it. They took it in vain. It was very hurtful to you. I talked to someone who told me that 
Uh, they were in a dating relationship for many years. And how it ended was the person said, God told me to break up with you. They said, well, does God not like me? Does God not think I can marry someone? Know someone? It was very hurtful. And I don't know what's happened in your life of someone misusing God's name, misusing the name of Christ in your life to hurt you. But I want to close with some words from Scripture. It's in Matthew 23 where we, where we just were. And it's how this chapter ends. Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, stones God's messengers. Listen to what he said. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. Jesus is saying, seeing how God had been misrepresented, how people have been pushed down, casted out in the name of God. He says, I want to protect them. I want to bring them back in to the fold with me. I want to protect them under the shelter of my wing. And I want to invite you to let God do that, to let Christ do that for you. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Lord, your name is one to be honored. It's to be cherished. It's to be used correctly. Your name is holy. It should not be abused. But we have abused it. And Lord, I pray for anyone who is under the hurt of that, experienced the pain of that, that they would sense your comfort and presence and that they could know the real you. Lord, every single one of us have a gap between what we say we believe and how we behave, a gap between the holiness, the treasure of your name, and how we represent it. And we confess that to you today. Lord, we don't want to just love Christian values but not have Christ shape our actual life. Lord, we don't want to be a fake. We don't want to put unrealistic expectations on others, appear better than we actually are, and value a status the world gives rather than serving others. So Lord, grow in us the ability to be compassionate, to be humble, to serve others. We thank you that in your love that you did that. We thank you for Christ Jesus who represents God perfectly to man. Lord, we take shelter under his wing. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.